It's the Final Word Cricket Podcast. Adam Collins and Jeff Lemon. We have Cam Ponsonby with us for the moment. He's our American correspondent, although uh, he's back in London fighting off jet lag. He has seen the Mumbai Indians, New York, beat the Seattle Orcas in the inaugural edition of Major League Cricket, uh, wherever it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, That's the orcas. We're going to level with, game chat. We're going to level with you, Cam. Um, we haven't watched a single ball yeah. with this. We're relying on your eyes to tell us how it went. Perhaps that's where we start. What what was the what are the vibes having spent a couple of weeks in the states with this competition? Yeah, I feel, I feel like we, we're going to have a, a clash of we're going to have a conflict here because I'm going to be quite positive about the competition. I think yep. surprisingly for you guys. Obviously, I've worked for one of the teams, and maybe it's a positive team view as opposed to kind of an overall. Um, kind of competition wide positivity but yeah mi new mumbai new york which is fundamentally quite a funny name uh they won the competition i wasn't there at the final because my team washington freedom we got booted out so um god i i was hoping to have a four day holiday in dallas and then i got a message from our ops person which just showed my flight home had been moved forward two days oh, i was like all right brutal i guess i'm going home then um but yeah the competition <laughs> The competition was, I think, in general success. I think it's been really interesting talking to people who have been involved in other kind of franchise competitions and how the kind of operations and kind of organization of it compared. I think the kind of overall feel was for the size of the team they have, um, what they've managed to do is quite impressive to get a tournament off the ground. I think they've only got like low double digits in terms of how many people are working on this thing but on the flip side they're saying that can also lead to frustration because it's like well things slip through the gaps because you're understaffed but overall like, it's like if you, if you if you had to do way too much work someone's like you know what what, for what you've managed to achieve is quite impressive but it's actually quite annoying because you've forgotten x y and z um i was kind of wanted one of the kind of seattle orcas do have an ipl affiliation but it's not as strong as obviously the teams that share the same name i think it'd been probably been quite um, probably quite good for the competition if one of the IPL teams hadn't won um, to kind of give a bit of distance, give a bit of space. I know I know the whole idea is that the IPL teams are trying to build like this club feel across the world, but yeah, I don't know if I, I don't know if that quite correlates. Well, yeah, that's it, can work, it, it can work for Manchester City buying its football team in Melbourne, then it, it can work yeah. for cricket from between Mumbai and New York. I think a lot of people also didn't realise there's this odd uh, sort of Victorian State Cricket Association. There's basically a New South yeah. Wales team and a Victorian team there as well. Tell us about that. Uh, it's quite... So San Francisco have a partnership with Cricket Victoria and Washington Freedom, who I worked with, uh, had a partnership with New South Wales. So when San Fran played uh, Washington, that was the kind of the new edition of one of the mm. oldest rivalries in cricket ever. The, the Aubrey-Wodonga <laughs> clash. And the thing is that... It, yeah. The thing is, though, it did actually have an a added element to that because obviously all the backroom staff at New Washington Freedom are New South Wales. So when we came to playing San Francisco, it was like, we've got to beat the Vicks. We've got to beat the Vicks. Come on. And um, so that was, it was quite interesting being, and I think this is probably where my kind of overall positivity about the competition comes from, is that I was effectively working for New South Wales, as it were. And New South Wales uh, director of cricket is Michael Klinger and the coach is Greg Shippard and the physio works for NSW and, and the operations, they they know what they're doing. So I felt like I was part of a very well-run operation where everything was kind of shit hot all the time. Um, and that potentially was in kind of contrast to uh, kind of other teams. So like what I remember in the warm-up matches, completely surreal uh, location. We were playing next to like a highway flying past in Houston and you literally got, like you, I can't stress, it. it's like you've played, you've played, we've all played at this cricket ground next to a busy road flying past can't hear anything but instead of it being us being rubbish it was like Devon Conway and Faf Duplessis opening the batting and just <laughs> no one knowing all these people Americans going past like what the hell is this going on and little do they know it's like the best players in the world um, but like matches like that we were kind of there early and like I remember one of the teams we played against kind of rocked up 10 minutes before like toss basically or to start time advertised so I felt very much like we've got to beat everyone we're 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 well organized and that means you have to win if you're well organized you win and it doesn't matter that someone can score 100 or 40 balls we turned up on time so we're better yeah getting changed in in, in the back seat of your car just before the toss kind of energy exactly. um you know afternoon tea a, a pack of biscuits that everyone opens up together and, and that kind of thing I suppose you know you're right there's huge names like Nicholas Piran player of the tournament. We all know him. Trent Bolt found time to take 22 wickets in, I guess, what, five or six games, which Same reflects... Same number as he took in the 2015 World Cup, I reckon, there from memory. Go. So yeah, which one means more to him? him? 
Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's all of that going on with the higher profile players. I think a bit of a subplot to all of this, Cam, was that um, we've seen briefed out the World Cup schedule for next June and July, at least parts of it. And America confirmed as one of the co-hosts. I think that was in some doubt a couple of months ago when the ICC were in town here at the Oval for the World Test Championship final. But two of the World Cup venues that have been mooted, uh, the one yeah. in Texas, Prairie, is it Prairie Ground? Yeah, Grand Prairie, yeah. Grand Prairie and the game and the ground in North Carolina where you also uh, were for um, the Major League Cricket. Give us a sense of what these grounds will feel like when the entire world comes around next year for, for a World Cup. Yeah, so the best way I can describe it is Grand Prairie is at the stadium and Morrisville is, is an outground. So Grand Prairie, the players were kind of overwhelmingly uh, positive about Grand Prairie in Dallas. It was legit. Outfield's beautiful. There's a proper square in place, changing facilities, kind of thumbs up there, not a problem. Um, they were, work, don't get me wrong, they were working to give a bit of context. Before the tournament, the reason why there was a big training camp in Houston is because that was a change. It was meant to be, there was going to be half the teams in Dallas, half the teams in Morrisville, but they went, no, no, we need all the time we can get to basically be ready for the competition. So then we trained over in Houston, which is fine. Uh, Morrisville was fine eventually. I think there was a bit of concerns when we got there, um, that basically there'd been a lot of rain. The outfield was, it, it's an outground. It's, 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 a, it's a local council facility. So I was sat in the media tent um, and to my left is the swing set, like where the kids go <laughs> play the park. Like it's, kind of if you like your quainter more kind of atmospheric areas that that will do it for you from a playing perspective it's not as kind of up to scratch um i don't really know how it could be that that could be it'll be interesting to see how they develop that further in the year to, that is about to come i don't know i don't know why i can say that sentence there we go that's all right you're going okay you're jet lagged i can already see jeff and me recording <laughs> the final word T20 World Cup daily from a set of swings in North Carolina. You've oh, set it up yeah. beautifully for us, Cam. It's going to happen. Um, and the other grounds will be Fort Lauderdale in Florida, where John Davison took his 17 wickets in the Intercontinental <laughs> Cup match um, against the USA. And uh, New York, where, where will they play in New York? I just don't know the answer to that one. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering if it's going to be like a baseball ground repurposed, like when Warney and Sachin did their, oh, yeah. you know, their all-stars tour when they just basically booked out what, you know, Yankee Park or whatever it was and um, and just went around and played on a baseball diamond and were hitting sixes on a, you know, a 40-metre boundary. Or Dingers! <laughs> but, um, yeah, the only, my only correlation with New York over the last four weeks was um, they launched the tournament at the Stock Exchange. They rang the bell and that was uh, kind of... Right. I, I, I imagine, I'm guessing they're not going to play it there, but that that can't no. be it. Hope they played it upstate New York and played up in in Buffalo at Rich Stadium where the Bills play. No, imagine imagine if Tim David and Gordon Gecko had a podcast. <laughs> uh, that would be some hot listening. We we should be so lucky. Uh, Cam, any sort of. Uh, uh, parting thoughts from you about the state of American cricket at the moment? Because you do kind of get a sense talking to people around the traps that things aren't going that well. I, I'm, and I don't mean on the field, I mean off the field. Was there any of that in your purview when you were there or, or are you far enough removed from it from a tournament perspective that you can't really kind of speak to it? No, no, I've got, so a couple of things I'd say is one, there's two different kind of things, Cricket USA and, and the Major League Cricket, two separate entities. Yep. Um, I think, I know there was, disputes between like domestic players and the league in terms of like contract stuff I think that's ongoing I don't really know there that's the kind of areas of discomfort in the, in the kind of scene I would say in terms of what the reason I would say why I started this and being like was saying I'm overall positive about the competition is you have a growing group of players there who are there and there for the long run and you're now basically padding out for what is a growing junior game so we got I got taken out by one of our players who plays for the USA. He's called Usman Rafiq. Moved to the US when he was 15. He's now what, like kind of in his mid-30s. And he showed us the local kind of Dallas Youth Premier League. And it's a growing competition. They've kind of got 1,500 juniors across the region. And that number is getting bigger. And there was this kind of golden um, soundbite from one of the coaches, which said, four or five years ago, parents used to ask me, what is the future of cricket in the US? Now no one asks me. Because there is basically, basically what's happening is, and this is a kind of equivalence I, I can't really unpack, but it's basically a rich Indian sport at the moment. I kind of assumed what it was, would it, what it would have been is a kind of, kind of English, Caribbean, South Asian kind of diaspora, everyone playing. It's not at the moment. So like Usman was kind of saying, we know there's a big Nepalese community. How can we get them in kind of so, and America's a big enough nation 
that this idea of it challenging baseball, this idea of it becoming one of these major sports, that's a nonsense. There's no point in trying to aim that high. And I don't think that necessarily is aiming high. I think there is a population that is already there and is increasingly being engaged, which is big enough that you will over time have success and have a kind of a strong enough local community. They've obviously thrown cash at the top end of it. And there's enough cash of that to make that work. The next, the problem is the next five to 10 years, the short to medium term of how do we fill up this competition, which is, has stated its aims that it wants to increase the number of teams in the short term future. Mm. That would be the challenge. I was getting annoyed at kind of an English point of view where it's like MLC. Oh, it's, oh, it's... Basically, England have, by a geographical quirk, where they're the only nation like, above the Tropic of Cancer, has had this whole six months to themselves. <laughs> now, there's one other team, there's one other country, which is like, actually, we'd quite like to play in this time as well. And it's like, oh, fucking hell, they're killing English cricket. And it's like, well, no, they're just like, there's just one other person who wants to try and play. Um, and I think I, I was kind of get that frustration of out the one side of your mouth, you go, oh, we want the game to grow, grow globally. And from the other, you go, oh, but not, not in our summer, not in our summer. Thank you. Sure, um, but it's, it's classic NIMBYism, right? You know, yeah, of course, yeah. there should be more affordable housing, but don't build it near where I no, live. Of course, house. there should be more. There should be a, a new underground line, but we don't want yeah. any construction happening. So how did it go in terms of the, the, the US player um, portion? Because there, were, there was a, a higher proportion of overseas players in these teams than you would normally see in a um, in a team in a league run by a full member country. Um, how did that pan out? A, like a very very fair criticism is kind of like this weird definition of what a local player is yeah so in other in other nations and other tournaments you have to have done three years to qualify as like a local residence or whatever in the us in this competition you just have to promise that you will stay for three years so they're kind of like quite egregious examples of lads rocking up the day before the draft and being like i am american i'm a local player basically mm-hmm. and that's that's kind of written on the of... bottom of the Statue of Liberty, mate. That's all you have to do. You just have exactly. to rock up. This is the, the, the kind of cheesy American dream thing. Of yeah. Like it, it, it kind of, I remember talking about this with a colleague being like, how much can we sell this? And it's like, well, no, like that is the kind of the American, that is the kind of American dream ideas that you can come over here at any point from a local state playing point probably doesn't help you if you're on the outskirts of the U S team at the moment, but in terms of like building the strength of the competition, it work like it does work like in terms of Washington Freedom, our, our domestic players were allowed to average forty in South South African first class cricket and had played a couple of ODIs for Pakistan. Like they're good players, and so for the strength of the competition, that works. From the, a very fair kind of criticism of that is okay. Where does that leave the room for the lads who actually are playing here locally? Mm-hmm. And have been here for the last ten years, and have trying to haven't have been working for this end goal. Um, and like Peter Delapena at Crick Info um, has been writing a, as kind of along those lines, kind of what is what is next? Okay, great, we've had a nice opening tournament. Where do the local players actually fit into this competition moving forward? Yeah, and and I think that, that that's a conversation about the women's game as well. That where there could be enormous opportunities for growth, where there isn't quite the same saturation of major sports so i know um wmbl uh, wmba rather um and, and there are other sports that that command the attention but there's no american football for women that has the same purchasing power likewise baseball although there is softball but not at the, the same scale so it might be a, a women's cricket story with those junior players coming through uh camp thank you so much uh for uh keeping an eye on this for us over the last couple of weeks while working for the washington freedom i hope they ran out to George Michael Freedom every time, like Jerusalem. Um, I hope they ran out to Beyonce Freedom. Beyonce Freedom. Much better track, let's be honest. (laughs) Our little tagline was Sweet Freedom, which was uh, apparently some 80s song, which I I didn't didn't choose, but I put it on the end of every tweet for the entire four weeks. So there we go. You've done your bit. We look forward to catching up with you uh, in uh, London soon enough. And thank you for all the work you do for us here on The Final Word. No problem. See you guys very shortly. That was Cameron Ponsonby back from the USSA um, and feeling chipper. And we're feeling chipper. So let's have ourselves a little round of Node Pledge. Node Pledge, the game that we play with the nice people on the internet who help fund this program by sending in contributions in a financial sense. But these things, they're not, they're not in normal round numbers. They're in specific numbers. The mm. numbers relate to cricket in some way. Yes. And we have to figure out what the number means. For instance, this nerd pledge comes in from Michael Fallon. It is $4.31 in Australian currency. And Michael says this, I will go clueless for now, as it's hopefully a bit more straight down the line than some of my... 
previous efforts. I will say he he meant to say previous efforts, but typoed it and said precious efforts, which made <laughs> me read that initially in the voice of Smeagol um, from The Lord of the Rings. My precious, nasty, <laughs> tricky night pledge. But uh, four thirty-one. That's what we've got. And I thought straight down the line, four thirty-one. What's the straightest down the line thing to do with a nerd pledge? It's a cap, uh, cap number. number. It's a cap number. Who's cap number four thirty-one? There are only two countries that have gone that high. Uh, I know who it is. Why one, don't you tell me? Well, one of them's Colin Milburn. But given oh, it's it, Colin Milburn. Yeah, it'll be fun. Which would have been before. fun. But given it's AUD, I thought it's probably the Australian one. It's going to be Jackson Munro Bird. Uh, Big Jack from St Ignatius College Riverview. Who? I mean, it, it, slightly. Slightly done over in a couple of ways. Like, could have had a yeah. better run at it, Jackson Bird. Yeah, I uh, mean, he's. A, I think he. I think I'm right in saying he's the leading wicket taker all time for Tasmania in Shield cricket. He's mm -hmm. got fabulous first class numbers. He's taken 447 scalps at 24, which is hard to do in the Shield. And it was on the back of his Shield work that kind of got him noticed by Australian selectors. I watched his Test debut, MCG, one of many Melbourne debuts on Boxing Day, going all the way back to Tony Dottomade. Um, Matthew Nicholson, mm -hmm. Brett Lee, mm -hmm. Jack Bird. Oh, yeah. Fast bowlers at the G. There's a thing about that. I'm yeah, watching it's that. the match where Mitchell Johnson roughs up Sri Lanka and sure does. they ended up nine, what, only having nine fit players on the last day because he I sent think two were, of them to the hospital. That was seven out, all out, or eight out, all out on what became the final day on the fourth morning. It was like a really weird time in my life when mm. I returned from England working on the Olympic Games. You talk about the, um, the horrible things about them. They do good things too, like put on, you know, Olympics. Um, but... I'm sure, not, I mean, I'm not the, discounting. the thing itself is good. The organisation yeah. is yeah, no, full I'm, of yeah. crooks. I was doing the, you know, the nice bit, and um, and got back from there, and I'd gone back to politics, and you know, was sort of very committed to that, but had this two week window mm -hmm. where I went back to Melbourne, um, and watched the entirety of that Sri Lanka Test match. First day, I went to a stag do, bucks do, um, which was great. Um, watched Kumar Sangakkara bring up his ten thousandth Test run. I've been pretty lucky on that front. I saw Steve Waugh. I saw Kumar Sangakkara, I saw Eunice Khan, and I feel like I've seen another one recently. We've seen, we've seen Joe Root, and that's it, at Lords last year. Mm -hmm. Maybe a couple of others. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Sangakkara 10,000. And then Young got Nathan his hand Lyon. broken by got his hand Johnson. broken. Young Nathan Lyon taking wickets on day one, which was quite exciting mm -hmm. for me because you know it was only a couple of years before that that we were playing at the same club as him. And Less Jack successful Bird, than Young Rock or Young Sheldon, yes. that show. And Young Jack Nathan Bird Lyon. bowled really well on that first day and then and took it through to Sydney the following week where he'd grown up and and played cricket initially mm. before going to Tassie to play in the Shield. And it felt like Australia had stumbled upon like a successor, albeit with a gap, mm. to Glenn McGrath. He looked like Glenn Similar McGrath. Yeah. He felt very similar. Well, he's gone back to New South Wales just recently. Yes, that's so right. He's finally yeah. gone full circle and headed home um, at the age of 36. But yeah, he, he has some adventures. He, he plays in England, one test match in that Durham match that I've talked about a oh, bit, yeah. written about a bit over the last few games, the last few days, which had some parallels to the Oval match in terms of Australia, big run chase, Warner, big partnership at the start, sets them up for it, the rest of the order don't follow through, Stuart Broad involved. How did that work with, um, So, because uh, that's the James Faulkner test as well, isn't it? No, Faulkner's at the Oval. Faulkner's at the Oval, yeah, right. So, so Bird gets left out for Stark Faulkner. plays the first, third and fifth, and Durham's ah, the right. fourth, okay. so Stark misses out for the fourth. Ryan Harris plays. Sexy Ryan Harris. Sexy Ryan Harris. Yeah. And and I can't remember who comes out because Faulkner bat Faulkner bat seven. Pattinson plays the, the first. Siddle. Yeah. Um, oh right. Yeah. They might have recalibrated sure the batting Faulkner line. Bat seven. Yeah. And they jig it around a bit. Yeah. And yeah. There yeah. As an all rounder. Because Haddon's keeping and might bat at six possibly there. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so that's so he he does he does play in Durham. He gets to have an Ashes. Test match in England, and then has that good tour of New Zealand that we remember. Mm -hmm. Where, or well, he, he, it's it's not so great in the first test, and he's probably going to be dropped. And then Peter Siddle gets injured. Siddle, uh, Siddle or Pat? No, it's Siddle. It's Siddle. Yeah, that's right. Because Siddle bowls the house down on day one. Mm. Bird bowls nervously, like mm. you know, he returns to the team. It's the fifteen end of the fifteen sixteen summer. He's yep. not played the home test matches. They take him to New Zealand because I think Stark wasn't about. Pattinson was about, Cummins wasn't about, obviously. Pattinson wasn't fit for the first test and came, came for back the for the second. second. But and just thinking it through, in terms of who wasn't available from the big dogs, Hazelwood might have been yeah. missing through injury as Hazelwood well. Hazelwood wasn't there. Stark definitely got injured at Adelaide of that summer against yeah. New Zealand in the first pink ball test yeah. match and was in a moon boot for like six months after So the that. way I remember it is that Pattinson was definitely going to come in and uh, so that Bird was going to be dropped and then Siddle drops out with injury instead. So and Bird this is like a year, Siddle, Siddle gets badly hurt. Yeah, yeah. and Bird 
goes really well. So Hazelwood d does play in that game. I just checked that. Um, but Bird, oh, right. Bird goes really well and takes five for um, in the second innings there, a couple in the first. And, yep. and you're like, okay, well, he's on his way now, um, which isn't exactly how it works out. He gets left out for the South Africa series in Hobart because his batting's not good enough at number 11, according to Rod Marsh. Oh, yeah, that's right. It was Joe Manny was... Joe, Joe, Joe Manny, Manny had selection. a better average, yes. Had a better batting and average, and they wanted to make sure they linked 11. from the tail. Yep. Um, it was in the Uncle Rod era of Rod Marsh's chairmanship of Select. Because the first test of that series, it's again at Siddle plays at Perth. Mm -hmm. looks good on day one. Remember, they bowled South Africa out for about 200 on day one with Stark bowling heat, Siddle bowling well, Nathan Lyon not making a contribution but in the attack and one mm -hmm. other. It wasn't Joe Many. Yep. It'll test me who it was. might have been Hazelwood. And it was Hazelwood. And then the next week, Many comes in... Mm. Um, for Siddle, who's injured, mm -hmm. instead of Jackson Bird, because Bird's seen as being, yeah, not, not a good enough batter. It's such a weird era. And yeah. so he comes in in Adelaide after they clean house and sack five players, and it was going to be six yep. if Steve O'Keefe's cuff hadn't yep. gone that week and Lyon would have been sacked, which would have been an interesting diversion. He comes in and plays the South Africa test in Adelaide. Bowls um, well. And bowls well. Yeah. And then he has a, you know, a couple of good tests against Pakistan um, in that same summer. And so he's, he's, still, he's kind of the fourth seamer at that point. And, yeah. and he gets to play one more Ashes test when Stark misses out in that 17-18 uh, series. Stark, oh, plays, Melbourne. Stark plays four and he's got a foot problem for the fourth test and misses Melbourne and Bird plays. It ruins his average, Bird, because yeah. I haven't got it in front of me, but my recollection is that Bird has a couple of nunfers there. Yeah, he, sneak, well, no, he has one nunfer because they only bat they only, only bowl once. once. That's because, right. And, it, and it's so much so that I think I wrote a column about it for The Guardian where the indignity of someone like Jackson Bird having the keeper up to the stumps, and it had mm. nothing to do with him. No. It was just the sadness of watching someone who wasn't slow, back where he made his test taboo, yeah. and the pitch being the biggest heap of shit you've ever seen. Well, yeah. it's got some it's got some um, competition in, in matches we've seen in the last yeah, little while. That, that Melbourne one up against Roel Pindy or Melbourne, Rub, Melbourne, Roel Pindy, Underbard and Edgbaston this year, are, are, you know, are duking it out to get on the podium. Yeah, yeah. I think the first three have the, uh, the fourth one covered. Yeah. So, yeah, I can tell you exactly, actually. He goes from, he's averaging 27.4 before that test match and ends up at 30.6. Yeah, so that's cruel. Into the that's cruel, because I don't reckon he plays again does no, he? No that's his last test. Yeah. Um, and, and he's unfairly judged on that you know um, that was the era Mitchell Stark just couldn't play at Melbourne he kept getting injured all the mm -hmm. time or left out and rotated and so on and, you know Bird having <coughs> fought hard to get that chance in 16-17 in 17-18 yep. he's only seen as that like you know when someone's injured and yeah Stark's back for Sydney and yep. and that's it for Bird. Yeah, I, I didn't realise it was that that acute because he definitely goes back to domestic cricket after then and runs oh, mark. Plays really well, and but you know, so that's why I thought with the wording of a uh, straight down the line, that was kind of his bowling approach. You know, hit the seam, sharp angle, bang it in there, yep. and just keep doing that. He was straight down the line with that tiny bit of deviation from time to time. Um, a terrific bowler at uh, in the, the few opportunities he had. Still played nine test matches, which is uh, nine more than most people. And is still going around in domestic cricket to this day. That is my Nerd Pledge nomination for Michael Fallon. It's Jackson Bird. Thank you, Michael. Time for us to take our first break on the final word. On the other side of it, we'll be talking about Australia's women's, well, the Australian women, let's try that again, Australian women's tour to Ireland and a couple of other bits and bobs before we come home strong with the county championship.